Well, greetings, everyone. Uh, it's good to be gathered in the house of the Lord together. My name is Brady Witten, and I welcome you to worship here at First United Methodist Church, uh, and I also welcome those of you who are joining us online, at home, wherever you may be uh, tuning in. So today is the second Sunday of Easter, and we're going to continue to explore what are known as the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. Uh, and today we're going to discuss why resurrection, in particular the physical resurrection, matters. Uh, we're also going to celebrate today uh, presenting Bibles to our second graders, which is always a highlight in the life of the church, and today we'll have 23 of those students uh, throughout our three worship services. I invite you to lift your hearts with me in prayer. God of signs and wonders, you have revealed to us that Jesus Christ is your Son and our Savior. Strengthen our faith in Him and in the resurrection, that we may have life in His name. Lord, pour your Spirit out upon us in this time of worship, and it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And I invite you to stand for our opening hymn.
invite you to take your seats. So it has been a long tradition of our church and many others uh, that we present a Bible to students, uh, sometimes usually around second or third grade. Our church does it right about when they're getting ready to graduate from the second grade. Um, and we have 23 young people this morning that, who, who will be receiving Bibles, uh, and uh, they'll be receiving them at all, in all three of our worship services this morning. But I do want to let you know, uh, the Bibles for our church have been uh, presented through the years by the Men's Heritage Bible Class. And uh, Ed Jeffries, who uh, was the leader of that class, came to me probably about a month or so again and told me that he's like, he's the last standing member of that class and that uh, they're not going to be meeting anymore. And so uh, I did, I did want to just make sure uh, that if you all know and see Ed Jeffries to thank him for their years of uh, faithfulness in providing the Bibles to our young people. And I also want to invite you to do something. We're going to try to figure out a way to continue that legacy. And I've already began asking some other groups in our, our church if they will continue that. But today, we also want to provide you with an opportunity to provide uh, a fund that we, can, you, uh, that we can purchase these Bibles from. So if you look under the announcements uh, section, where is the announcement section? The, the very first announcement here says, for many decades, the Men Heritage Bible Study has provided Bibles to our second grade students, and there's a QR code there. So if you'd like to be a part of helping us to start a fund to, to provide these Bibles for these young people, uh, I want to invite you to scan that QR code uh, and encourage you to, to give generously. Um, but I do want to invite Sarah Wright is going to come forward. Uh, and Sarah uh, works in our children's ministry, and she's going to be here to present the Bible to these young folks. And... Uh, when I call your name, if you're here, we invite you to come forward and find Sarah. She's going to give you a Bible, but then I also want to invite you to, to stay up here when you have your Bible. So uh, these are our second graders who will be receiving Bibles today. Davis Edward Abadie, Lillian Anding, Maxwell Claire Cephalou, Rosalie Santani, Adeline Grace Sinman, Samuel Philip Sinman, Kennedy Corcoran, Landry Thomas Dugas, Roland Ezel, Ava Fontanet, Grace Hood, Ellis Truman Hurley, Maggie Jacobs, Rhett Palmer McCormick, Graham Mullins, Caden Pendergast, Margaret Pernici, Liam Michael Snyder, Daniel Trailer, Grace Tyler, Charles Fitzwilliam Varnado, James Fielding Wiley, and Henry Ewing Yorn. Okay. So uh, how many of you received a Bible from this church or, or, or any church when you were in about second or third grade? Raise your hands real high. See all these people out here? You're, you're joining this great group of people who have, who've received their Bibles. And I still actually, hey, y'all can turn, turn around and look at me for a second. So I have actually held on to the Bible that I got. Uh, this was given to me in the third grade. And it, it says right here in the front, presented to Brady Witten. And this was in 1979. Does that sound like a really, really long time ago? Yeah, back in the, back in the 1900s, I received... <laughs> my Bible. <clears throat> um, but I will tell you that uh, I think one of the most important things that we can read in the Bible and learn from the Bible is about Jesus. And uh, for me, Jesus is, is the thing that helps me to understand the whole Bible. So I want to encourage you to read it. I want to encourage you to get to know Jesus um, and to kind of use, use Jesus and what he taught and who he was to read the whole Bible. Okay. But, but I just, I'm, I'm a, I love Jesus. 
I do, and this is where we learn about him, right? Uh, and I want to issue you a challenge too, and that is uh, there's the very first little book in the New Testament is the book of Matthew, and I always encourage our second graders when they get their Bibles to start by reading the book of Matthew, okay? So if you'll do that, and when you're finished with it, come and find me on some Sunday morning, and I, I have a gift that I want to give you, okay? So what are you going to read? Matthew, right? And when you're done with that, come find me. And I really do. I'm, I, I really do have a gift for you. I, I will, I'll, I'll give you something for doing that, okay? Um, but how about if you turn around, and I'm going to ask everybody to join me in praying a blessing on you, okay? And, and if you all are comfortable, would you extend a hand of blessing as we pray over these young people? Let's pray. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning Uh, May these young people hear them, read them, learn them, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, they may cling to the hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Okay. Thanks, guys. What joy it is to celebrate with our children today in this very sacred time of hearing God's Word and living that Word in their hearts. And so in celebration of our life together, I want to point out these beautiful flowers here that are given to the glory of God and in memory of Liam Corville by Jean and Dick Bingston. And this beautiful rose is in honor of the birth of Lorelai Clare, child of Kale and Kate Wittekam, born April 5th, 2024. And this votive candle is in, in memory of Alice Cruz. So let us now go to the Lord in prayer and with our hearts open. God of the cosmos, creator of the universe, in the beginning you created the heavens and earth, and you breathed the breath of life and spirit into each living soul. Today, we pray that we may become instruments of your healing peace, for the transformation of this world. Through your synchronistic power and in your glory, you continue to amaze and inspire us, aligning moon and blazing star in a total eclipse, bringing together light and dark, near and far, faith and reason. Uniting experience to experience, heart to heart, and soul to soul. Through your wisdom and in your mercy, help us seek that same harmonious balance of unity and peace within our souls. God of the Incarnation, you sent your one and only Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You forever revealed your healing power, your mercy, your forgiveness, and your unconditional love. May the peace of Christ become our peace for the healing of this world. May the words of Christ dwell richly in our hearts and minds. And now, in this sacramental silence, let us breathe in the love of God. Let us allow this love to hold us to heal us, to renew us, to tenderly care for our souls. Let us always remember that we are never lost or alone, never forsaken or abandoned, 
Christ is with us. We live in the eternal now. Today, may there be peace within us. May we trust in God's infinite power. May we not forget the glorious possibilities born of faith. May we use the gifts we have received and pass on the love we have experienced. As we pray together the prayer, Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And as we sing the last verse of our next hymn, all of our children are invited to come down for the children's sermon, and we invite those at home to join us for this very special time together. read all of Matthew when you were in second grade? That's amazing. Well, now you're a great example for these new second graders that are going to read Matthew. Verse. That was your favorite book? No, my favorite, I have a favorite verse. What is your favorite verse? I forgot. I know it's in Psalms. It's in Psalms. That's a very good book. Y'all should also read Psalms, second graders. Okay. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. How are we today? Good. Okay. So I have a question. You ready? What holiday did we just celebrate in the church? Easter. Easter, there we go. And during Easter, we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. Who's learned about Jesus' resurrection? Yeah, that's whenever Jesus died on the cross. But then how many days later? Three. Three. He came back, and he was alive. Isn't that kind of crazy? Yeah, and whenever Jesus came back, he wasn't just a spirit that you could, like, sweep your hand through. You know, it wasn't spooky. He had a body. 
and he had to show us he had wounds on his hands to show his disciples that he was truly back in his body, and it was really Jesus. Now, speaking of bodies, we all have a body, right? We have these amazing bodies that God gave us, and our bodies can do so many cool things. So in this bag, I have some things that our bodies can do, okay? So, I have a football. We can play football with our bodies, right? Catch, you ready? Good catch. All right. We have a jump rope. We can jump around with our bodies. Who loves to jump rope? I do. Yeah, well, here's a jump rope. Here you go. And then something else that I love to do, and I think you'll love to do it too, snacks. Our body can eat. Who loves a good snack? Yeah, you can hold this. Don't eat it here. Don't eat it, but you can hold that. Now, when Jesus was resurrected, he sat down and he had a meal with his friends, so he ate and he used his body and he walked all over and he visited people and he used that amazing body that God gave him. So God gave us these amazing bodies and we get to take care of it. So how can we take care of our body? Maybe we can exercise it to keep it strong. Who likes to exercise and run around? Yeah? Jump rope is exercise. Yes, jump rope is exercise, yes, and it's so good for you. And we can fill our body with really good food to keep it healthy and make sure that we don't get sick. Yeah. Okay. So we can always remember that God gave us these amazing bodies to help serve the world, right? Now, will you pray with me? This is a repeat after me prayer. Dear God, thank you for all the wonderful things that I can do. Thank you for all of the wonderful things that Jesus did. Let me live my life for you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Can I have this cheese? It's back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as the children return to their seats, I want to invite you all to stand and to share the peace of Christ with your neighbor. And I invite those of you at home to extend that greeting in the comments. Uh, text your friends, whatever you want to do. happening in the life of the church that I want to lift to your attention. And as I do, I want to invite you to find the attendance pads that are at the end of your pew. And if you can pass those down your row inside that pad, uh, you'll find a slip of paper that says connect with us. Uh, if you worship here regularly, you know the drill. Uh, if you're visiting, uh, first of all, I do want to offer you a very special welcome. We're really glad that you're here. Uh, you could have chosen many places to worship, but we're glad you chose to worship with us. And if you would spend a little more time with that slip of paper, give us an email address, uh, some way to, to contact you. We would just love to be able to reach out and say welcome. And if you ever have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and, and ask as well. So uh, Second Sundays is Second Sundays are Mission Sunday here at First United Methodist Church. Uh, and our church is always a church in mission, but on Second Sundays we, uh, we give attention to some uh, very focused things. And I do want to encourage you, this is something we're going to uh, start doing for a little while, is on, on Mission Sundays you'll find on the back of your bulletin a long list of missions that our church supports. Uh, and I just want you to know by, by being a part of this church, by supporting this church with your uh, prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness, uh, you are a part of, uh, of helping out in, in these ways also in life of the community. So uh, we do have mission lunch today. It's going to be fried chicken, and you can pick it up following uh, the 945 hour, and it's available in the conference center, which is just outside this door. Go down the ramp, and I always tell everybody, right before you're about to leave the building, hang a, hang a left, and you'll find the conference center. Uh, again, it's fried chicken, and it is going to support the One Stop, uh, which is an organization, or it's actually a location run by the Capital a City Area Alliance for Homeless. And uh, they do great work with our homeless population, and it is a great ministry to support. So if you buy, uh, buy lunch today, the profits will go uh, 
to, to support that group. Uh, we also do have Salsa for Sale that supports the United Methodist Children's Home and our Methodist for Social Justice group. They've been taking up hygiene kits and uh, now they have switched and they're uh, taking their, their uh, collecting t-shirts uh, to provide for uh, the homeless folks in Baton Rouge. And you can find out more information about that in your bulletin as well. But I hope, hope you'll participate in, in those mission opportunities. Um, I also hope you'll take note of other opportunities in the bulletin. There are always opportunities to uh, join into classes and Bible studies and worship opportunities and other serving opportunities. Uh, and I hope uh, that you take some time and note those things and not only note them, but also to participate in them. And with those things said, I'll invite our ushers to come forward as we take up our offering. And as they come, uh, will you bow your heads with me in prayer? Generous God, every good and perfect gift comes from you. In you, our hearts are glad, our souls rejoice, and our bodies find rest. We ask that you bless and multiply these offerings, that they may bring the joy of your presence more deeply into the world. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Risen Christ, you fill your disciples with boldness and fresh hope. Strengthen us to proclaim your risen life as we hear your holy word. In your name we pray. Amen. Hear this reading from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. 
They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Yet for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. And he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Tommy. So I misspoke at the beginning of the service. This is the third Sunday of Easter. Uh, But we are still in the Easter season, and in the church, uh, the Easter season runs from Easter Sunday all the way to Pentecost. It's 50 days. Uh, But the Bible tells us that in those 50 days, that for 40 days, Jesus appeared to his disciples and many others, and he really did two things. The Bible tells us first that he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive, and then he also continued to teach. Jesus was a teacher, and he continued to, to teach the disciples, I kind of say, what God was up to and, uh, and what job that they had going forward. But one of the most interesting things about these post-resurrection appearances, that the times of Jesus appearing in those 40 days, is the many details that point to Jesus having a physical body. And so we find these details all over the place. And I would encourage you, as we explore these stories and read these stories, for you to kind of look at some of these clues. Uh, In our reading today, for example, Jesus appears to the disciples, uh, and their first thought when they saw Jesus was that he was what? A ghost. Did you all catch that? And, and, And people in those days, like people today, you know, believed in kind of disembodied spirits, things like ghosts. And so if if a if a person who had died appeared in front of you, what would you assume? They were a ghost, right? But Jesus then goes on to make sure they know that, hey, I'm not a ghost. And he says, I'm not a ghost. I mean, it's one of the first things he says. Uh, And then he says, look at the wounds in my hands. You know, touch me. He tells you, you you can actually touch me. Uh, And and then he goes on, he does something that I find absolutely fascinating. He says, hey, have you got anything to eat? And they give him a piece of broiled fish. And if you notice, the Bible tells us he ate the fish in front of them. So this wasn't just some, like, routine Jesus was doing. He actually physically ate the fish in, in front of them. So again, this physical physical part of the resurrection is an essential part of the story. Uh, it is so essential that it's actually preserved in many of our most important creeds. So take the Apostles' Creed, for example. We, we say, I believe in the resurrection of the, the body, right? We, we say that every time we say the Apostles' Creed. But here's what I want us to explore uh, as we think about this text and think about this idea. Why is this physical part of the resurrection so important? Uh, Why did the early church preserve this in the scriptures? Why is it enshrined in our creeds? Why does it matter? What does it tell us? What do you think, by the way? You got any ideas? What do you think? So I want to suggest three different things, three reasons I think that the physical part of the resurrection matters. And and the first thing is this. Uh, The physical resurrection tells us that what God created is good. What God created is good. So uh, there were multiple schools of thought in Jesus' day uh, that taught uh, uh, kind of what's called a a dualism about the world, right? That there's material things, and material things are bad. Material things are evil. And that there's spiritual things, and that spiritual things are good. Uh, A a lot of these schools of thought are kind of lumped into something known as Gnosticism. Uh, But again, the idea is material things are what? bad, material things are evil, and and spiritual things are good. There was actually a very popular religion in about the third century. It was considered one of the competing religions against Christianity in those days called Manichaeism, and it had this kind of notion of the world that, again, material things are what? 
evil and bad, and that spiritual things are good. And, and by the way, this is a possible explanation for why this world is so hard and why there's so much difficulty in the world and why there's suffering and why there's sickness and why there's death. The answer is, well, material things are bad and spiritual things are good. So if that's your view, uh, what the best thing that you can hope for, what you're really hoping for, is to one day escape this corrupt material world and to fly off to some spiritual you know, pla- place for all, for, all, for all of eternity, right? Does that sound familiar, by the way? A lot of people kind of have that notion today, don't they? Do you? Uh, so what I want you to know is this. This is not a biblical worldview. Uh, the Bible does not view material things, the creative things of the world, as evil and spirit as good. In fact, the Bible tells us that when God created the heavens and the earth, when God created all that there was, if you read in that very beginning Genesis story, he looked at all of it, and what did he say about it? He said, it is good. And I always want to remind us that when God created human, human beings, he looked at them and he said, we were very good. It adds a little superlative there, right? Sunsets are good. I was driving back and forth from uh, Woodworth, which is around Alexandria, to Baton Rouge the other day, and I had to stop at Lee's and get some pie, right? Chocolate pie is good. (laughs) Uh, A hug is good. And, And I would ask you, what's something that you love about the creation? What's something that you love about what God has created that you would say, that's good, right? Can you can you think of something? So the Bible teaches that the problem that we face is not with material things. It's not that the creation is bad. The problem, the Bible tells us, is the human heart. We are the ones who have turned from God. We are the ones who misuse God's good gifts, right? Uh, But because of Jesus' physical resurrection, one of the things that we're reminded of is that the physical stuff is good. God's not abandoning it. God's not giving up on it. Uh, God's not giving up on the creation, Think about it, if, if that's the story the Bible wanted to tell, then I think this is how Jesus' appearances would have ended up looking. He'd, he'd have shown up post-resurrection, and he'd have said, Phew, thank God I got rid of that body. I mean, that thing was such a pain, and, you know, and, uh, and, and he would be, say, so, you know, now I'm going to float off to some kind of spiritual heaven. But that's, that's not the story. Again, the tradition goes to great lengths to tell us Jesus had a physical body. Uh, the physical resurrection shows us that God's plan is to restore things. The Bible tells us to restore all things in heaven and on earth and to restore them to that original goodness. Which brings me to the second thing I think we can learn from Jesus' physical resurrection. God cares about human bodies and so should we. Uh, So we live in a world where many things are disposable, right? Uh, If something breaks, you just Throw it out and get a new one, right? But what do you do if you really care about something? What do you do with it? Uh, Jim, this is what I was talking to you before. Like, how about a classic car? What do you do? Do you throw it out? Jim's going, no, you don't throw out a classic car. You you restore it. You refurbish it. You renew it. How about a family heirloom? Have you all got anything special that's been kind of passed down in your family? You don't throw that thing out. You you hold on to it and you take care of it and, and, and and you restore it. Well, if you look at the story of the resurrection, it's apparent that God cares about human bodies. See, the Bible tells us that it's not only Jesus who is raised physically. The Bible tells us that you and I will be too. Romans 6, 5 says this, If we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now, everybody gets nervous when you start talking about this. They go, wait a minute, Brady, this body, man, I'm not sure that I want to hold on to it, right? I went bowling with with Ethan, my 13-year-old, this week while he was on spring break, and I woke up the next day and I realized bowling is a sport for young people. You know, I mean, I was so sore. I was like, how did I get so sore, right? So, but, but here's the thing. When we think about our bodies and we think about them being resurrected and thinking about them being restored, uh, we won't have the same old falling apart bodies that we have now. That's good news, right? Uh, Paul actually says this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, what's sown is perishable, what's raised is imperishable. What's sown is in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. What's sown is weakness, but it's raised in power. 
What's sown is a physical body, and what's raised is a spiritual body. Uh, so, interesting thing also about these, these uh, post-resurrection appearances, Jesus does have a physical body, but his physical body also has some interesting characteristics, like it can, it can apparently like pass through walls, but it can do things like that. So, we'll have physical bodies, but they're not quite the same as the bodies that we have now. So, for me, this idea that God cares about physical bodies, God cares about human bodies, fits perfectly with the, the Jesus narrative. Think about this. When Jesus was on the earth, what kind of things did he do? He healed people's what? Bodies. He fed people's bodies, right? He actually tells us when we pray, he says, pray to God, give us this day our daily bread, right? So, like, so Jesus is, not, is caring for people, but he's not just caring for them spiritually. Sometimes we, we kind of have that idea, right, that, oh, this is all about spiritual stuff. Jesus actually cares for people's bodies. He tells the disciples that they should do the same thing. He tells them to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to welcome the stranger, to clothe the naked, to care for the sick, right, to visit people who were imprisoned. What, are, what is all that about? Caring for people's bodies, right? So as Christians today, we also are called not just to care for people's souls, although we need to do that, we're also called to care for their bodies. I was looking through this list of all the different things that our church does, right? Uh, caring for people who are homeless. What is providing shelter for people? It's caring for their bodies, right? Uh, what about Maison de Ami and the Youth Oasis and the Baton Rouge Youth Coalition? For all these things are caring for people's physical lives and their physical well-being. Uh, our ministry, Revive 225, which has become such an important important part of what we do as a church is about uh, caring for people's shelters, right? Uh, we, we collect food to feed people. We collect hygiene kits. All of these things have to do with bodies. Um, I would encourage us when we're thinking about that to always ask the question, what else is God calling us to do, right? Okay, I better keep going. But from now on, when you think about Jesus' resurrection, especially the physical part, I want you to remember this. God cares about human bodies, and we should too, right? And the final thing I think we can learn from the physical resurrection is this. We have something incredible to look forward to. So when you think of the world to come, when you think of kind of like what's coming next, what, what do you think of? What, what story do you have in your mind? You know, I mentioned earlier that a lot of people think, oh, we're going to leave behind this terrible world and we're going to go on to some, like, place in the sky, right? Some, some kind of spiritual realm. Is that the story you, you tell yourself? Of course, uh, other people think that there's nothing to come at all, that this is all there is, that the material world's all that there is. Um, but again, I want you to know that neither of those are a biblical view. The Bible tells us that not only was Jesus raised physically, not only will you and I be raised physically, but our eternal home will be a physical home. Is that, is that disappointing to y'all? See, to me, I, this is like, to me, one of the coolest things about the biblical story. Uh, God's plan, remember, is not just to restore some piece of the creation. God's plan is to restore the whole of the creation. Revelation 21, which we find at the very end of the Scripture, describes that time this way. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. So let me, if, if, you, if you listen to that, let me ask you, is this about us leaving here and going off to God's place? Is that what it says? What's it say? God's going to come here and live with us. It's kind of this connecting of heaven and earth. So these things that now to us seem to be separate are together. Uh, and God dwells with human beings. So in the world to come, you and I will not be floating around on the clouds playing harps. And all I've got to say is, thank God. That just sounds awful to me, right? Um, a new heaven and a new earth, the Scriptures tell us. Can you imagine it? I really, I really think we've got, to, we've got to go here. The best of this world, all the best things about this world, sunsets, chocolate pie, hugs, 
What did you add to the list? What did you add? All of this, all the good things of the creation, with none of the bad. Uh, Revelation 21 goes on to say this, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first, first order of things have passed away. Can you see that? Can you imagine that? A world with no war, no missiles, no drones, uh, no poverty, no taxes. Tomorrow's tax day, right? Uh, No political parties, no sickness, no death. That's the image that the Bible paints. Now, some will say, and I do feel it's necessary to say something about this, some will say, but Brady... The Bible says that not everyone will experience this new heaven and this new earth. And, and I want to say this. I don't have to, it would be a whole sermon if I chased that, but here's all I want to say. The Bible does say that. It seems to indicate that. And it's something that I think we should take seriously. But let me ask you this. If you're concerned about your final destination, if you're concerned where you're going to end up, I just want to give you two pieces of advice. First of all, Jesus Uh, The Scriptures tell us that if that's a concern, Jesus is the answer. Trust Him, follow Him, believe in Him. And the second thing I want to say is this. If you want to know how to do that, I'm not going to try to get you to say like a single prayer right now. I think there's more to it than that. But if if you want to know what it means to trust Jesus and follow Jesus and and believe in Jesus, there's a great book that we provide every Sunday morning uh, called The Good and Beautiful God. And it does a really good job of kind of just explaining the very basics of the Christian faith, who Jesus is, and and, and about living, uh, living this new life with Jesus. So on March 20th, 1991, boy, that sounds like a long time ago, right? Uh, Eric Clapton. Come on, how many, how many people still know who Eric Clapton is? Okay, good. Uh, but in 1991, Eric Clapton experienced a parent's worst nightmare. It still gets me when I think about it. His four-year-old son fell from the window of a high-rise in New York City and died. Uh, That year, he wrote a song that I think they still play called Tears in Heaven. And in that song, he asks these questions. Would you know my name if I saw you in heaven? Would it be the same if I saw you in heaven? Would you hold my hand if I saw you in heaven? Would you help me stand if I saw you in heaven? So, Anyone who's ever lost a loved one has had these questions, right? Right. So in an interview about the song, Clapton said this, the song asks a very pertinent question. He said, because I don't really know. I have a belief in a higher power, uh, but I don't really know whether most of those old religions say, see you over there, and you think, really? How do you know? How do we know? How do we know? See, as Christians, we know because we believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Not just spiritually, but what? Physically, right? God's plan is to restore the whole thing, including you and me and our bodies and and creation. New heaven, new earth. Will we know each other's names in heaven? Will we be able to hold hands in heaven? Will we be able to hug and dance and sing and enjoy all the wonderful things of earth in heaven? I would say to you that because of Jesus, we know the answer to that question. And because of Jesus, the answer is yes. Yes, right? So why does the physical part of the resurrection matter? And I would say to you, it really matters. First of all, it reminds us that what God has created is good. Uh, It matters because it tells us that God cares about human beings, human bodies, and by the way, we should too. It matters because it tells us that we have something incredible and amazing to look forward to, a new heaven and a new earth. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
So it's always a privilege as a part of worship uh, to invite anyone who's looking for a church family to consider making First Methodist your church home. Uh, you know, I, I talked about trusting Jesus and following Jesus and, and believing in Jesus, and that really is what we're about as a community. Uh, but I think one of the most important parts of that is we don't do that alone. Uh, we need each other, and we have each other in that journey. Uh, and so we have a gathering that we call Believe and Belong, and if you want to become a part of this church, you want to become a member of this church, uh, we would in invite you to attend one of those. You'll find some more information in your bulletin about that. And uh, if you have any questions about Believe and Belong, you'll see uh, Susie Rivera's email in the bulletin. Feel free to reach out to her, and we'd love to help you in any way. And I also want to remind you about that resource table uh, and the book, The Good and Beautiful God. Uh, again, it's one of the uh, best most simple sort of explanations to me of what it means to follow Jesus and to live a Christian life. There's also a great book back there on the basics of the Bible and on uh, who we are as United Methodists, what we believe, and if you want to take any of those, I invite you to, to take them with you this morning. I invite you now to stand as we sing our closing hymn together. As you go from this place, put your trust in the God of resurrection, for the God who can raise the dead to life again will also raise you. Go with the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.